you should have received a connect card or a warm welcome in the online chat. Please fill out the connection card and leave it with one of our ushers as you exit or review the connect information on our website at BibleCenterPGH.org. If you've been visiting with us for a while and would like to make Bible Center your church home, please see one of our members after service today and we'll be glad to get you connected. We have begun a new Bible study in the book of Psalms. Books are available today after service for $7 or at the church office. For more information about Bible study times, please go to bcpgh.info forward slash announcements. Please save the date for our annual church picnic, Sunday, August 7th. We are looking forward to having a great time and lots of great food, fun, and fellowship. Please contact the church office at 412-242-4920 to RSVP. We will also celebrate all of our grandparents on Sunday, September 11th. We are able to do so many great things and provide support and programs to the Homewood community because of your faithful giving. There are several ways to give here at Bible Center. You can give via Venmo at BCPGH, through our website at BibleCenterPGH.org, or you may use a giving envelope and drop it in the offering basket or mail it to our office at 7238 Flory Way, Pittsburgh, PA 15208. Thanks again so much for your giving. Everyone have an amazing week. children's church today but we still want to pray for the kids so if you can bow your heads father god we thank you god we thank you for waking us up this morning for allowing us to see a new day god we thank you god for giving us a chance to honor you again god we thank you god for our children god we thank you god for those that were able to bring their kids today god just so that they can be blessed by your word god we thank you, God, for even those who are watching online, God, that their children are tuned in, God, so that they can receive whatever it is that you would have for them to receive, God. Bless their homes, God. Bless their neighborhoods. Bless their communities, God. Bless the school years getting ready to start, God. Let's just get everything in order, God, so that these kids can be ready for what you have for them, God. We thank you, God, for all that you are doing in our lives and all that you are going to continue to do in their lives, God. We ask that you just continue to bless them, God. Fill them with your spirit. Fill them with your love, God. And allow them to have the opportunity to get to know you on their own. Amen. We thank you, God. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Oh, wow. I have a loud voice anyway, but okay. <laughs> um, so let, let's pray before I, can, I get started in the word. Father God, I just thank you for your presence. I can feel you here even right now. And God, we've come to glorify you, to bless your name, to give you all that you deserve. The hallelujah that is down in us, Lord God, you deserve all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It all belongs to you. Lord God, I ask that you bless this word. Bless it, Lord, um, to take root in our hearts, in our minds, dear God. Let everything be said for your glory and for your honor. All of you, Lord, and none of me. And Lord God, in Jesus' name, I'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and praise that you are so richly due. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, I have to tell you this. Last Sunday, <clears throat> as I was leaving, um, you know, we're... The pastor is doing a series on um, ordinary and extraordinary. So, you know, I, I love the Lord. I love the word, you know. So as I was walking out, and I parked right out front here, and before I got to the light, 
the Lord had dropped in my spirit, Gideon. And he gave it to me so forcefully. I'm driving, I'm getting excited, you know, about Gideon and how he is. You know, he went from being the least to being a deliverer. And I got to that light, and then I turned the corner and got to the next light. I'm like, oh, wait, you want me to speak next week, right? I'm like, okay, God, you know. And that, that's how he does, you know. He prepares you. He doesn't leave you without knowing, you know, what he wants you to do. And so um, in talking about uh, uh, the least to the deliverer, we're talking about ordinary people becoming extraordinary in the hand of God and what he wants you to do. And when God has assigned you to do something extraordinary for your good and for others, he doesn't consult with you. He doesn't call. He doesn't, hey, would you like to do this for me? You know, because many of us would say, um, no, you know, let so-and-so do it, you know, because a lot of times we don't feel qualified within ourselves. And that comes from how we judge others to be better than us, you know, how we judge ourselves to be less than and not qualified. But in God's eyes, where we lack, he makes up. And in him, we don't lack because he has prepared you all the way to the point of where he's about to use you. Um, we get stress. We get stress when, when we call to do things. Um, and we hope sometimes that when we're talking to God and we're trying to point out the better person that he would change his mind. But he doesn't because the assignment that God has for you is for you and only you. Amen. Gideon was chosen by God to be a deliverer for the Israelites. He was already in God's eyes a great warrior. His name even means great destroyer and one who cuts down. But at the time in the, script, in the scriptures, Gideon, for Gideon, God was nowhere to be found. He was hard pressed to believe God even cared about him. And sometimes that happens to us when we get in hard pressed places and we know that we love God and we know that God loves us. And when we go through for so long and it's so hard, sometimes we want to say, God, where are you in this? In Judges 1 to 10, um, the Israelite, they again were um, being disobedient and not honoring God and not living the way God had told them and instructed them to live. And as a consequence, they had been oppressed by their enemies for seven years. They were living in caves and shelters and not in the promised land that God had already given them. And um, he brought them, you know, through the Red Sea. Um, he brought them through in the desert. There were so many miracles that they heard of. This generation didn't know God, but they didn't know him intimately and personally. But they were aware of God because of the stories that their ancestors told them down through the years. So Gideon knew the miracles of God and what he has done in the past. And when you know what God has done for others, when you know what he's done for you, you look for him to come to your rescue immediately. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to feel less than. We don't want to go through the negative things. And so we do trust God and we call out to him. And sometimes God's working things out. Israel had strayed, uh, the Israelites had strayed away from God. And he needed to remind them who he was and who they were in him. Amen. We're going to pick up at Ju uh, Judges 6, 11 to, through 13. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. They could not even work outside. They couldn't plow. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't sow grain. They could not do anything because they were being so oppressed, they trampled everything. They didn't kill them. You know, that's one thing. They wasn't at war with them but they just made it so that they could not progress in their lives. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And that's what we do so many times when we're going through. 
we turn to God and okay, God, why is this happening? You know, we, we've done anything. Well, okay, I made a mistake. Why is this happening? And so we have a tendency unknowingly to blame God because he could have done it. He could deliver us. He could make things change. But the faith that he had in God was born out of stories that he had heard from the ancestors. They kept talking about it. They kept um, reliving every step of the way. And so that's what we do with our children. They don't see God the way that we see it unless we show it to them. And they see it through our eyes. And that's how Gideon knew about who God was. So he was well aware that God was able to deliver them. He was well aware of what God could do. Gideon's faith was not lost. It was just shattered. But with a shattered faith, it can be restored. If you haven't lost your faith in God, and maybe it's, it's, it's just a little dragging, maybe it wasn't as strong as it was last year, maybe whatever has happened, event, life, um, changing and altering, event has taken place, your faith has just began to waver a little bit, but that's just a shatter. It can be put back together by God, as long as you don't walk away from him. Um, so when Gideon asked the question of the angel, where is God? If you notice, he ignored that. He didn't even respond to that. Why? Because God don't have questions. God has answers. God has solutions to your problems. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? God had just commanded Gideon to go and be a deliverer for his people. Gideon said, so he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am in the least in my father's house. Gideon was viewing himself through his eyes, through his lens, through his vision. He had no faith in his family. He had no faith in himself. He couldn't see how this insurmountable assignment that God had given him could even come to pass. And so what he was doing was giving, uh, giving excuses, which is a human concept. You know, when we can't see what God sees or when we're faced with insurmountable circumstances or something that takes us out of our comfort zone. When the Lord gave him the assignment, he considered himself by himself. And he, he couldn't see it. And a lot of times when God has asked us to do things, we feel the same way. You know, we look at our finances. We look at our education. We look at what we have, what we don't have, who I can go to, who can I turn to. And we don't see it. And so we don't think that we can do it. But God does not see us how we see ourselves. He already saw Gideon as the mighty warrior, which is what he called him. He already saw him as the ordinary to be turned into the extraordinary for his good, for God's purpose. So our statue in life is not important. Our strength or lack thereof is not important to him. All things that mankind looks for in the making of an extraordinary person matters very little to God. The examples we have of that is Moses. Moses, uh, Exodus chapter 4, 10 through 14. Moses had been called by God to lead uh, a million people out of Egypt, God's people. And Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to me. He had a speech impediment. And sometimes when we have um, problems, we are ashamed of them, and we don't want it to be put on blast. We don't want to be in the front. And God has a tendency to just push you right up there because it's for him to use you according to how he has planned. Then the Lord had to remind him, well, who made your mouth? I'm just jumping through this. Who made your mouth? Who made the ears? Who made the eyes? Who, who is that? Wasn't it me that did it? But Moses still was reluctant to do it. But when God has something for you to do, you will not get out of it no matter what you say. You're going to do it. But God, God got angry. The scripture says he got angry. But because it was more important that Moses do what he needed to do and be strong in what he was doing, God relented. Okay, I'm going to let your brother speak for you. Is that okay, more or less? And he said he's on his way. So God already knew he had Aaron on his way. 
and everything was okay with him. And that was okay. The next person that did that or the next situation was in Numbers 13 through 33. Now they had just come through the Red Sea. They had saw Pharaoh just tore up. God just did away with them. And so um, they were sent out, 10 spies were sent out to spy out the land. Now if God brought you here, it wasn't like he wasn't going to give you what he promised you. God says, my word will never fail. And we have to rely on that. But they went and they saw the descendants of Anak come from Nephilim. They saw them. These were the giants. And they compared themselves to the giants. And they said, we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So we must be like grasshoppers in their eyes. They judge God by themselves. God's ability to do what he said he was going to do, they judge by themselves. And as a result, that whole nation under 40 years or over 40 years old never made it to the promised land. Sometimes when we don't want to do what God says, the way God says, it not only affects us, but it affects those around us. Then we see what God looks like. God was choosing an extraordinary person, another ordinary person to turn to be extraordinary for his good. And he sent Samuel to the house of Jesse, and he was going to find his ordinary person. And Jesse was parading all, I'm not Jesse, I'm sorry, Samuel. Samuel was parading all of Jesse's sons before him. And they were tall, they were handsome, they were this, they were that. And, and Samuel thought, surely this is who God wants. And God told him, no, the Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at your heart. You can be a child, and if your heart is right, you can be 60 years old, but if your heart is right. And you can be 20, any age, it doesn't matter what you look like. If your heart is right, God can use and will use you and take that ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary. Excuse me, extraordinary. So Gideon actually was being prepared for service by God. He first went down and talked to him, called him by the name God called him by. And he was preparing him to do what God said that he would do. He was going to be a deliverer for God's people. God instructed Gideon to do something that could have killed him, and he knew it. The people of the, the Israelites at that time, they were worshiping other gods. They had set them up. They had Baals. They had um, the, the different poles. They had everything. They had removed the very presence of God and installed these false gods. So God told Gideon, to go down, tear those down, and then began to sacrifice the way that Moses had instructed them to do. Now, getting a note that you know, I could lose my life doing this, and he had a choice to make. Do I save my life or do I obey God? That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Now, they've been in captivity for seven years. God's using a bull seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut, cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him, but because he was afraid, he did it at night. Number one, God was, was restoring his rightful place in the nation. He wanted them to know, I am yet God. Even in spite of all that is happening, in spite of everything that you're doing, I am God. And in order to do that, he did away with the false gods that they were trying to worship. Gideon was afraid to do it. But you know, sometimes obedience will diminish fear. Because if you're afraid to do it, and you go ahead and do it, and nothing happens, Gideon didn't know if he was going to live or die. But God was in the mix. The fact that he obeyed God, God wasn't going to let nothing happen to him. And the townspeople, they made a lot of noise about it. 
But they said, okay, well, if Bell is God and he's mad, let Bell handle him. Well, we know there is no Bell, so nothing happened to him. When you are obedient to God the first time and you live through it, then the second time God asks you to do something, all you got to do is remember, hey, nothing happened before. You know? So I can do that. I can step out on faith. I can trust God. And it's baby steps, yes, but it's stepping. And what it is doing is building up, stirring up that faith, stirring up that courage in him. That's stirring up that man that God has already put down inside of him. God knew it was there. So a lot of time, God knows what's in us, and he knows how to bring it out of us. And when he does it, it's done. So Gideon did it at night, but it was okay. So, and Gideon said, now God's going to confirm him. He knows he has to work with fear. He knows he's working with an ordinary man. He knows what he needs. And God's willing to work with you as long as you're willing to do what he says. So God said to God, so, God, so Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, don't be angry with me, but let me speak just one more time. I pray just once more with this fleece. Let it be dry, only on the fleece, but on all the ground around it, let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew all around. These are two miracles because there's no way that could have happened. When you walk out in the morning, dew is everywhere. It doesn't skip anywhere. And so for Gideon, this was, God. This was a miracle that he saw. Gideon had to go and, and get an army of people who have been beat down for seven years and tell them God has given the, the Midians into our hands. He had to give them something to make them want to follow him. And he did. He was able to tell them this miracle, I believe. So God honored that request because he was, just needed assurance. He wasn't testing God. You know, and many times when God asks us to do something, we want that same assurance. God, I'm willing, I'm wedding, ready. I just want to make sure you're telling me. We don't fleece, but we fast, and we pray, and we seek God, and we go to his word. God, is this really te you telling me to take this step, to move out of this city, to go for this job? I remember uh, several years ago, I walked away from my job, and my family thought I had lost my mind. They, they literally, like, and, you know, they talked among themselves, but you know somebody's always going to come tell you what they said. So, I, so I'm like, yeah, but see, you don't know where I'm going. You don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes you can't tell everybody what the Lord has told you to do because if you listen to them, they will discourage you, and you will find yourself not being obedient. But Gideon had to call these people, like God has given them to, the, you know, given us the victory, we go in a war. And he put out the call, and 32,000 people showed up. How awesome is that? Based on his testimony. If we could just give our testimony, hallelujah, and tell somebody, just one person can we bring in based on our testimony. You know, we think that we're just ordinary, and, and, you know, what happened in my life doesn't mean anything, but it does mean Amen. something to God, Amen. just for you to tell it. We can't be ashamed of the things that we've gone through. This is life. It happens to everybody. But your life, your testimony might save one person's life. Just be willing when you're called to do it. Amen. Then in chapter 7, Judges 7, 1 through 2. Then Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, because the town people changed his name. They got mad at him. He's no longer called him by his name. And all of the 32,000 people, they went up on the, on the mountain, and they're ready to go to battle. And they looked down, and they said the, the camels, you couldn't even count the camels. That's how many people were there. And so you got to stop and think, there's only us, and it's them out there. So God said, uh-uh, 
I can't, I cannot, because they already believed, because Gideon told them about the miracle, God's going to give them to, you know, give us, uh, put them in our hands, we're going to win, got the victory. <clears throat> but see, God knows your heart. Even when you're working for him, he knows your heart. And he said, I can't, I can't do that. He told Gideon, I, I can't do that because then these people are going to say, they saved themselves. And God says in for Isaiah 42 and 8, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give another, nor my praise carved into any images. See, he wasn't going to deliver them and they go back and say, we did it and began to still praise and glorify those false gods. God said, mm -mm. you've got to know that I did it. And when you know that God get, did it, won't nobody take it away from you. Every morning you'll get up and thank God for my life, my health and strength. Thank God for the sanity that he's kept me in. Thank God for provisions. We're all sitting here. The pandemic has come. And it has abated somewhat, and we are yet here. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us. Our lives might have changed somewhat, but we're still here, still able to pray, still able to lift our hands up unto God. So we know it was God and nobody else. So God needed them to understand that. So then he does the unexpected. He says, Gideon, everybody who's afraid, tell them to go back. And he probably thought one or two people would, okay, yeah, they're scared. 22,000 of his 32,000 army left immediately. So how, how do you think Gideon is feeling at this time? And he's looking out at the, at the army of the other. And I have 22,000. But you see, God wasn't even finished yet. He said, you still have too many, 10,000, still too many. He weeded them down to 300. I'm going to say for Gideon, he was scared. He had to have been at that point. He was scared. 300 people. God, God is God. I only got 300 people. God's given me the victory. I only got 300 people. But to his credit, he didn't turn and run. That ordinary man, something was stirring in him that said, if God said it, I don't know how he's going to do it but God is going to do it. And the same thing happens with us. When we are faced with odds that are against us, Lord, I yet trust you. I yet believe that you can. I don't know how, but I yet believe you. And then in my mind, after he's left with 300 people, I believe Gideon did what we do when we face odds that are against us. He laid down and began talking to God. God, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. God, I trust you, but I just don't know where I'm going. But the most important, important part about that is God started talking back to him. He started telling him, it's all right. He said, get up. I bet it. Get up and go down. And because God knows our ordinary human frames, he said, if you're yet scared, go down and take your servant with you and hear what they are saying about you. And so Gideon got up, and he went down there. He took his, his servant with him, and he overheard the dream that his enemy had talking about him. And the thing about that is I was sitting there thinking, well, God gave the dream. God gave the interpretation, and God gave the victory to Gideon. And once, and I, I am not reading this, but once Gideon heard that, the very first thing he did was bow down and worshiped God. He knew that God was going to do exactly what he said. And the one thing about this whole thing, they had no weapons. How do you go to a war against hundreds of thousands of people with no weapons? They had a torch in a, draw, in a jar, and they had a trumpet. But see, if you are obedient and do it the way God says do it, you don't have to worry about it. 
So what he did was he told them, okay, go down there, and when I, when I blow the trumpet, you blow the trumpet, and then we're going to smash our, our, um, our, our uh, jars. And that's all they had to do. So when they went down and they did that, here was this ordinary man doing still ordinary things, a jar, a torch, and a trumpet. Nothing extraordinary about that at all. But the one thing that was extraordinary was God was leading the way and Gideon was following behind him. And so as I was getting this together, I began thinking, when God steps into your situation, everything's got to move and bow down to the God of all gods. Hallelujah. It can't stand. No matter what's going on in your life, that situation has to change. If God said it was going to change, all you have to do is be obedient and follow God's instructions. And sometimes we want to change the instructions. Yeah, God, that sounds good, but I'm going to do it. Mm -mm. Follow God's instruction because God's walking through. He is handling everything for you. When he walked through the camp, the weapons that the army had, they turned on each other. The noise that they heard so sent them into chaos. They were running. And now these 300 men are chasing them. This, this one ordinary man who didn't think he amounted to anything, he said, I'm the least in my own family who don't make anything, you know? But God saw that person as the one I can use. Because sometimes when we think we all that and we're big and I got this and I got that, hmm. That's not a heart God can use. Amen. That's not a person God can use. But when you humbly come before him, God, I'm willing. Just show me how to do it. Just tell me what to do. That's who God can use. And then you do become that extraordinary person. So God went in, Gideon behind him, and the rest of the story goes that he rooted them out. He called on help, and maybe those 32,000 or those 22,000 and the rest of them, now that they see him on the run, here they come. You know, now they have the faith. Okay, that's all right. And during the course of Gideon's life, they turned back to God. They lived for God. God reigned in that place once again. So when, when we are obedient, when we don't think we can do anything, you know what, God might have you to speak to one person to change that person's life. And in the eyes of God, you have done the most extraordinary thing because you have been obedient. You obeyed him and you changed the course for that person's life. Maybe God just wants you to show up every day and be faithful. Maybe you don't know what you're your gift is or your assignment is. So what you do is you practice it. And how do you practice it? Just being faithful. Getting up every morning praising God. Letting him know, God, I love you. I'm here. Whatever you need me to do. Reaching out to those who are in need. Just being available to do the things that God wants you to do. And then when your assignment shows up, you're already prepared to do it. That's how God uses us. Gideon was nobody in his eyes. And a lot of times we go through, we don't think that we amount to anything. People ignore us everywhere, every walk of life. But you know what? God's watching. He sees you. And if you don't bow down to that unnecessary talk in your own mind, if you dare to stand strong and say, okay, but God loves me. God loves me. You can treat me like you want to, but you best be careful. God loves me. When you know that beyond a shadow of doubt, it doesn't matter who does or does not do anything because God will have them doing things and you don't even, they don't even know why. Because he has called you to do something and when we go through things, it's just preparation for that extraordinary thing. In the life of Gideon, it was to save a nation. In our lives, it might be one person. But either way, we are extraordinary people in God's eyesight. God bless you. So, um, 
This is gonna be the end of our service. I hope you got something out of this. I hope it's been a blessing to you as it was to me. And we're gonna stand and be dismissed. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for how you see us. We thank you, God, for your love and your kindness towards us. We thank you for encouraging us. We thank you, God, for lifting us up. We thank you, God, for your presence in our lives. Lord God, make us just want to be better for you, want to do your will, want to be obedient to your word. God, change our hearts if we're not there. Change our minds if we're not there. And Lord, if we're there, continue to strengthen us. Continue to walk with us, talk with us. Continue, Lord God, to lead us and guide us, guide us according to your way and to your will. Now, God, I ask that you bless and keep each and every one here. Lord God, those who were unable to come because they were sick, Father, I ask that you touch their hearts and touch their minds, touch their bodies, Lord. Encourage them that you're yet with them. Even in their sickness, you haven't forgotten them. Because Lord, you love us. We belong to you and we thank you. So Lord, I pray this week that you bless each and every person that is here. Give them the strength and the mind and the will to do everything that you have called them to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You are dismissed.